Good morning, this is Dr. McDaniel at GYN Corner. I'm a board certified obstetrician gynecologist in New York City, and I'm bringing to you all things health related for women. Thank you for joining me at the corner today. Uh, this is part three, uh, tres, uh, trois, forget my Italian, I took Italian years ago. Um, this is part three on uh, is it an ectopic or is it a miscarriage? And that's a very, very good question because I had a cousin whose girlfriend was misdiagnosed as having a miscarriage. They actually gave her medication to uh, expulse or to spit out the retained pregnancy tissues, what they thought was in the uterus. And she had an ectopic and that is a life-threatening situation without treatment, obviously. So I thought it best to present this information so if someone potentially falls into that scenario, they know which questions to ask. Uh, so the first question, now this is part three, so obviously the two previous presentations I went into great detail on <coughs> how we, excuse me, <coughs> if you watch this channel, you know I have that, um, allergies, so I'm coughing. Uh, but I went into great detail on um, how we date the pregnancy, uh, the significance of the blood draw, the hormone, pregnancy hormone, or the HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin, and how we evaluate the sonogram. So I'll try to do just a brief synopsis if someone has not seen the previous two presentations, but uh, I encourage you to watch those because they're very detailed. So the pregnancy is dated by the menstrual cycle. We call it menstrual dating. Nagel's rule, we just take the first day of the last menstrual cycle, subtract three months, add seven days that gives us approximately when the pregnancy is due and then uh, we just are counting from there so if someone says their last menstrual cycle was March 1st then and they come into the office on April 3rd then they should be about four weeks and two days or four weeks and three days it's pretty simple <clears throat> so yes <coughs> occasionally I'll get the question hey um but I know when I had intercourse, so I know exactly when I got pregnant, and it's coming out a little bit less than that. Yes, because historically speaking, of course, women have been getting pregnant for millennia. For millennia, mankind didn't know anything about ovulation. We just knew the man planted the seed and the woman got pregnant. So the most obvious scenario event was that she used to get a monthly cycle, and we know when she stopped getting that monthly cycle, she was pregnant. So the easiest way to date the pregnancy was just by saying, hey, when was that last monthly cycle? Not by, hey, when did you have intercourse and when was your ovulation expected? So obstetrics, we, we still go by last menstrual period. And that may or may not end up being accurate based on how regular her cycles are and when she actually ovulates. But be that as it may, common things being common, most women have predictable regular cycles, so using the menstrual cycle as a dating method is appropriate. Even when we do the sonograms or the ultrasounds, the ultrasound calculates the pregnancy not according to potential fertilization, but according to the menstrual cycle. So it's always menstrual dating, and it's always going to be technically two weeks older than your pregnancy is. But that's the same with mankind, right? Because uh, when we call our birthdays, we call it from when we were delivered, but should we call it from when we were delivered or from when we were in our mother's womb? Because then we're all eight months, actually technically nine months older than our stated age. So <clears throat> philosophical questions, but moving upwards and onwards. So um, the menstrual cycle tells us how far along the pregnancy should be. Based on how far along the pregnancy should be, we draw a blood hormone test, that HCG, and that calculates to a ballpark figure of how far along the pregnancy actually is. Now, it's a ballpark figure because the range is wide. If someone is supposed to be six weeks pregnant, say, say um, that hormone for the HCG could range anywhere from, at six weeks, it could be as low as 800 or 900 and then it could be all the way up to 5,000, 6,000 I've even seen. So it can be really, really broad, but the minimum is what we're looking at. So minimally, that hormone should be at least 
900 to 1,000. If she comes in, we draw her blood and it's say 600, that's too low for six weeks. So I have her come back in two to three days. Now, if that lady is just comfortable, calm, the routine visit, uh, I'll tell her two to three days. And if the hormone has not appropriately risen, so at least doubled in that two to three days from what the initial hormone was, then it's a suspicious pregnancy for either an ectopic or for a tubal. If it has at least doubled, and realistically speaking, it's usually gonna be a little bit higher than a doubled. It's gonna be like two and a half times higher if it's normal, healthy pregnancy. Uh, then we say it's appropriate for how far along it looks like it is based on that hormone number. Doesn't look worrisome. If it has not doubled, say it's dropped, that's a miscarriage, doesn't matter where it is. It's a miscarriage, we follow it to zero. If it hasn't dropped, but it's kind of limping along, so instead of when it started at 600, uh, instead of it being around 1500, maybe it's only 900, then that's suspicious for either a miscarriage or an ectopic. And then we move on to uh, repeat the test again. When that hormone number is around 1200, we should be able to see a very early bag of water in the uterus. We call that a gestational sac. And <clears throat> if she's not in pain um, and she's not bleeding, then it's not an emergency. So we do the three tests to make sure what the pattern is, three blood draws. Once we determine that it's not appropriately rising and it gets to 1200, then we do the ultrasound or the sonogram. And 1200, we should be able to see that gestational sac. And the gestational sac will have a halo, a bright halo, what we call a decidual reaction, because the very early immature placenta emits, um, I guess, elicits a response from the lining inside the uterus, that endometrial lining, which we call the decidual layer. So we should see the gestational sac with that bright decidual reaction around it. If we don't see the bright decidual reaction around it, it is not an intrauterine pregnancy. It's a fake sac or what we call a pseudo sac. So it's just a collection of fluid or a collection of blood. And we can see that collection inside the uterus, but it's not a gestational sac. Whenever we do an ultrasound, we always should look at the next set, which means the corners of the pelvis or where the ovaries and the fallopian tubes lie. If that pregnancy hormone is low, so if it's under 1200, same as if the pregnancy were in the uterus, we're not going to actually see the pregnancy and the anexa, but we're doing that sonogram to confirm that we don't see an abnormal mass in the anexa and to check to see if there's blood or a lot of fluid collected in the anexa. Now, sometimes what will happen if there's an ectopic pregnancy, um, the blood supply is also. A little wonky it's abnormal and that lady will start bleeding if she's not in pain we shouldn't expect to see any blood because fluid in the pelvis will cause pain if she's in pain we may see blood it's either going to be from the pregnancy distending the um, the tube the viscous that it's in or from blood and fluid collecting in the pelvis that mounts an inflammatory response it's very painful so if she's in pain we we'll probably see some fluid collected. And years ago, what we used to do is we used to uh, do a colocentesis, and that means uh, put her in the stirrups, take a really long, um, basically a hypodermic needle, and then we would, um, I guess, plunge that needle in behind the uterus into the, the, the space, it's really a potential space if there isn't fluid there, the space between the uterus and the rectum, that's the cul-de-sac. Um, we used to call it Douglas's pouch, Douglas's pouch, but it's a cul-de-sac now. And we would plunge the, sir, the um, syringe that would poof air in, and then we would draw it back and we'd get either clear liquid or blood. Uh, I did that a handful of times when I was early in my career, almost 30 years ago. We don't do it anymore. Uh, it's kind of not necessary with all the, the other things that we have now, but we would draw that blood back. And if the blood does not clot, then we know it's abnormal fluid. We know we weren't in a vein, basically. So we draw the blood 
and then um, we let it sit in a, a little tube, a little phlebotomy tube. Uh, and if it clogs, sorry, I got briefly cut off there. Uh, I'm using my phone so when I get calls, it gets cut off, but I'm just gonna put these two together. So if it clots, we know we were errantly in a blood vessel. If it doesn't clot, then that was abnormal blood collecting in the pelvis. So we used to do that when ultrasounds and sonograms were not easily available. Now we all have sonograms in our office, so it's just easy to um, slap a sono on the pelvis and see if there's actually fluid in the pelvis. But we used to do that before we could do sonos, and I've had a couple of times where I drew the blood, it didn't clot, so I knew that was an ectopic pregnancy. It's kind of exciting when you do a test like that and you see that it works. Um, but those were the good old days. We don't do that anymore. We just put sino on. Hey, you got a lot of blood in your pelvis. Uh, so if someone's hormone number is pretty low, it's, um, well, it's around 1200, we should see, we will potentially see uh, a tiny gestational sac or um, a ball of water in what should be the tube or the ov ovarian area. Now, everyone who's pregnant has a cyst of pregnancy. We call that a corpus luteal cyst. And that cyst produces hormones to support the pregnancy until the placenta is large enough to take over that job. So the catch is you have to be able to know if it's a cyst or if it's an abnormal fluid collection or a gestational sac that's outside of the uterus. If that hormone number is actually under 1200, you're not going to see anything. So if someone's in pain, you see, uh, you do the sauna, you don't see anything in the uterus, uh, the hormone number is only 800, um, but you don't see any fluid collection in the pelvis, you don't see a mass in the pelvis, you just see a corpus luteal cyst, nothing in the uterus, the hormone's very low, let's say it's 700, then she's most likely having uh, an early miscarriage. But you can't say 100% that she's having ectopic. So at that small of a number, an ectopic, you, especially when you don't see any blood, it should not cause pain because it shouldn't be large enough to stretch out the, the area that it's in to cause that pain. And if there isn't any blood, then there isn't any reason for the pain. So the cramping is most likely uterine in source and you'd wanna give her pain medicine and then repeat the hormone in that two to three day time frame to see if the hormone is dropping stagnant or if it's rising. Now if it's stagnant on the second blood draw, then you can tell the patient this isn't a normal pregnancy. If she doesn't want to keep the pregnancy, then you might as well treat her for an, a, a pregnancy of unknown location is what we call it, an assumed ectopic. If she does want to keep the pregnancy, you do a repeat sano, you still don't see any blood in the pelvis, you don't see a mass or a gestational sac anywhere in the pelvis, and then at that point, you might want to look in the upper abdomen because very rarely they will float up to the upper abdomen and can attach into abnormal areas in the upper abdomen. You still don't see anything. Then you could give her one more blood draw to see if maybe it's actually is a very early pregnancy that's getting off to a poor start. If you do the third one and it's either it's lower than it's over, if it's stagnant, it's still over because now it's definitely an ectopic of unknown pregnancy and she needs um, medical treatment, which is methotrexate. Um, so I'm going to stop right there because we're at our time limit. So this is um, Dr. McDaniel. Thank you for joining me on this part three presentation of is it a miscarriage or is it an ectopic? Have a great rest of your day and please hit those like, subscribe, follow buttons if you enjoy the content and check out the not just the Facebook, but the YouTube and all of the podcasts, um, Spotify, Google, Apple, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.